Well, dude, let's go right into that story then. What were you saying? Are we recording already? Yeah, we're we're going, dude. Oh shit! You said you're you're driving up four hundred five. So yeah, I'm going on my way to work, riding up to four hundred five, and it's maybe about a year ago when like everything was crazy politically. I don't think it's as bad now, but it's definitely starting to taper off. I feel like. Oh, thank God, it was stressful. Well, and you're also, I mean, you were driving from Huntington Beach, right? Correct. So you're kind of in the belly of the beast here. Yeah. Like, yeah. Outside of Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Huntington's nice. There was no bullshit, you know? Uh-huh. But anyway, so I'm, I'm driving up the 405 on my motorcycle, and I'm splitting lanes as always, and I drive by this car next to me, and there's a little, like, like lesbian chick driving her fucking car, and it says across the back, defund the police, and it's written in, like, I don't know what they use. Like, what is that? Like, a high school shit? Like... Like prom twenty twenty one type deal, you know. Oh, like, like fucking just chalk. markers or whatever. Yeah, yeah, like complete fucking garbage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Defund the police. And I was like, man, like back when I was a younger, wilder dude, I used to carry a uh, ground up spark plug ceramic in my in my jacket pocket. So you could just throw that against the car window, and the car window would explode. It just like <laughs> shatters. So instantly. as you're as you're splitting lanes, as you're splitting lanes, if you someone just, does something fucked up, yeah, you, you reach in your pocket. And- yeah, <laughs> but I'm super chill. I never fuck with people because there's a biker behind me, and they're gonna fuck with him. Yeah, but unless they do something purposely. Like people make mistakes. I get it. I've made mistakes driving a car with bikers, but that's why splitting lanes is always kind of crazy. Oh yeah, because you're. You're at the fucking will of somebody driving like a fuck stick. Like a fuck if, stick? Like a fuck you, stick, dude. A fuck stick. If they fucking just don't check their blind spot or don't turn their blinker on and veer one way or the other. Yeah. That's yeah. it for you. I, I, uh, Bro, I watched a dude get killed on the 60 when I really? lived down here. Yeah, by Pomona. Wow. But I, I'm counting on you not to cross that double yellow line. Line. Yeah, if you cross that double yellow line, I'm, uh, I'm fucked. <laughs> That's kind of crazy, dude. But, so yeah, it says defund the police, and I was like, man, I would love to ride up next door to like one of the side windows and just hit it with the ceramic, right? <laughs> so her window blows out, and I guarantee you, she's gonna be the one that calls the police. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then they're gonna show up and see this chick sitting there with defund the police. Yeah, like. And it's like what we were talking about earlier. It's the meekest of the community that want to do these things that have no ability to defend themselves to begin with. Dude, it doesn't even make sense. The people that think that they want that because as soon as, as soon as you take law and order out of our society, bro, I'm not, I mean, it would literally be 15 minutes. (laughs) People would be shooting their neighbors, stealing all their shit. Fucking, it would be, fucking anarchy inside of 12 hours yeah yeah and, and these people don't have the ability to they don't have like a safe place to go or food stored or weapons they don't have any of that stuff and they don't even have the mindset no to survive that's the biggest thing i, I think a great example was when we were having all the riots i mean as soon as they said hey listen we're gonna let you guys do what you want Everybody started to riot and like destroy the communities and destroy the stores and just start looting shit that they didn't even need. Did you see any of that down in Huntington? No, no, they don't. They don't fuck around in Huntington. Yeah, Huntington's kind of. I don't know. Well, it's the first city outside of Los Angeles County, right? Yes, it is. Okay, mm-hmm. so I'm sure it's just like a different political structure and everything. Well, Orange County is very different than LA County, uh-huh. and Huntington Beach has its own culture too. They kind of look out for each other, and they're and, and uh, they're all about their community. And that's why I moved there 12 years ago. I love Huntington Beach. I, I couldn't see myself living anywhere else at this point in my life. Yeah, no, I fucking love Huntington too. I moved there for jujitsu. Yes, and I was there for like a year or so. But, uh, I mean, I couldn't afford to live there anymore. It's expensive, but worth it. It uh-huh. truly is. Cause I find that I always tell people, I love the culture and what is the culture to me? Because everyone's idea of the culture is different and living there, the culture is different for everyone. I think it's a lot of people that love free time and outdoors. Uh-huh. It truly is like everyone's riding bicycles. There's bicycle lanes everywhere. Everyone has a small house with a truck and a boat and an RV, so you can go out and do fun shit. No one's trying to like impress with this Mercedes Benz or this is my fancy this. Like, yeah, they're just actually doing cool shit instead of 
pretending to be cool. Yes. They're wealthy in free time. And uh, that's where what it's all about. Yeah, fuck, man. I miss Huntington. I miss Southern California in general. It's funny. Like everybody always talks shit on California because the crazy politics that yes. come out of this state. But California has a lot of cool shit too, man. Especially by the beach. Uh huh. You can't beat the the SoCal beaches and the weather. You can't. You still doing your park workouts? <laughs> No, I'm not. I don't really work out that much anymore. Most of my time is spent riding BMX in the in the summer, and then in the winter, I'm just snowboarding. And I I don't really work out much at all, bro. I've kind of it's kind of weird. I'm gravitating towards that myself. Like I'm still doing jujitsu, yeah, and like riding a BMX and snowboarding. Those are forms of working out. Mm-hmm. So oh, you're, yeah, you're staying extremely active. You know, extremely. But I've kind of lost my fire to go to the gym and like lift weights. Mm -hmm. or go on runs and i don't know why it's actually kind of been bothering me lately like i never want to go to the track or go to the gym i like yoga still i like jujitsu so maybe it's just time to do some different shit you know i think it's kind of like this is my theory on life nothing is permanent nothing is forever and you don't have to commit to these things or these or people you know it's the same thing it's they come in cycles and they're here and they're there and they're in your life for that period of time like you don't need to be married to a sport where you're working out all the time. And if you do, it's going to wind up hurting you. Yep. Like we saw with me with jujitsu. I trained jujitsu three times a day for five years straight and it fucking destroyed my body because I'm doing the same movements over and over again in the same, the same, uh, patterns. Yeah. You know, my body learns those patterns. Certain muscles get strengthened. Some don't. And then you get these. So what I'm looking for here, are these, uh, Mm, I'm gonna meditate on it. <laughs> <laughs> these uh, misalignments in the body; these uh, it's not equal, bro. I know exactly what you're saying, especially jujitsu, and especially as we got better because yes. we're both black belts. And I mean, we didn't even go into how I know you or who you are, but <laughs> grinder, <laughs> yeah, we but... on grinder. <laughs> But no, I mean, that's something that I've learned over the years. Once you're pretty good, you're on the offense more than on the defense. Mm -hmm. And that's all just compression and like, like you're bending forward and you're compressing your body. You're not getting that big open extension ever. And so when I started doing yoga, it's a lot of extension. Yes. And I was like immediately feeling like, oh, this is what's going to balance that. But the other side is like, I like that you said nothing's forever because I've, I've been telling people, I said, there's a, my jujitsu is going to expire at some point. Mm-hmm. And I know that. And I'm going to walk away when it starts. And, and you know, your injuries come in cycles and mm-hmm. it was bad for me for a while. Whereas like I was in pain 24 seven for probably like a year or two. Yeah. And I feel like I'm just starting to come out of that. But what are we doing? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, you know what I mean? Like if it's just, if your fucking jujitsu is actually debilitating you, that's, that's counterproductive. Absolutely. What are you doing it for? Yeah. And so, and it's just, I think the biggest thing is finding like the right people to train with because fucking fighting to the death every single night just doesn't make sense anymore, dude. But if I can't do that, I'd rather not play the game. I'll go. I'd rather go play another game then. Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you're saying there too. You know, because that's actually a. F- when we talk about fighting to the death, a lot of times I I talk about like the the downside of it because it does break you down, but it's also fucking fun. Right? It's the only reason I do it. Uh huh. Like, <laughs> yeah. like I was an MMA fighter before I was a martial artist. Uh-huh. What I mean by that was I wasn't specializing in anything. I wasn't training on a regular ba- basis. I just like to brawl. I like to fight. I, it, to me, that that is fun. So the reason why I chose to specialize in jujitsu before, say, like Muay Thai, because in Muay Thai, you can't spar hard as fuck every day. It's not the way class works. Yeah. But you can in jujitsu. That's right, dude. Every day you get to give 100% and go balls to the wall with the toughest dudes in the room. And that's what made it fun for me. Do you train much at all anymore? I see you in there sometimes at electric. Oh, almost none. I mean, in a, once in a blue moon, I will, you know, but. And do, do I miss it? No. Why? Because another big thing for me is the brotherhood, the camaraderie, the vibe. 
it's not what it was. All the guys that I came up with are gone. Yeah. You know, it's a different vibe now. It's more of like a family oriented gym where, you know, where we yeah. come from. And no, me and Joe out talk about that a lot because that's, he's running a better business practice. Correct. Like when we were all there, it was just kind of like a fucking murderer's row. Yeah. But how many students did y'all have? Like 12, <laughs> <laughs> which is cool, right? And, and that's, Unless you're Joe out trying to pay your bills. It's been that way in the fight game forever. And they, everybody knows fighters don't pay the bills, uh-huh. <laughs> but that's where the fun and passion is for the sport. For us, at least there's other people I know, like, uh, like a Jimmy tat, yeah, he, yeah. he loves being a coach and being part of the lifestyle. Yeah. For me, like, I, I, I like it, you know what I mean? But I want to train. I love being a coach to savages that want mm-hmm. to become fighters, and I like to instill what my knowledge of that into them. As far as, like, the, what's it called, the self-defense aspect and more, I it's just it's not as appealing to me. No, I know exactly what you're saying. But I, I've also kind of went through a shift where now I am starting to fall in love with like building a team. Yes. And and I'm doing the same thing. Like my gym is a lot more family oriented than it used to be. And it's not just me, Daniel, and Joey trying to murder each other every single night. Mm-hmm. I mean, we got 138 members now. That's incredible. Congratulations. You know, it's like a viable thing. And it's kind of weird how the universe, my life just changed in a moment and then the gym just blew up as a result and so like i got a little bit of notoriety so that kind of got the name out there a little bit Mm -hmm. but also we stayed open during covid and it was the only thing going so people are like i want my kids to try something and then parents will see it and they're like i think i want to try this and so since you stayed open during covid how many people from your gym got sick and died (laughs) no not not only not even died, got sick. Zero. Zero. Yeah, we had zero. I had one student who said he got it, mm-hmm. and he said he got it from some chick, and then I had another student that said he got exposed by his sister. And But how do you know? Bro, and I even said to him, I said, and this wasn't even that long ago, I'm like, I'm over this game. Like, I don't give a fuck if you got exposed. Come train. Like, mm-hmm. I'm over it, dude. If you want to come train, come train. If you don't, don't. I mean- People don't train when they're sick. That's how that's been happening since the beginning of jujitsu. Yeah. If you got a fucking runny nose or a sore throat, stay home that day. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Nothing has changed. If you feel sick, that's why I tell my team if you feel sick, don't come train. Otherwise, I don't give a shit. You know? Mm -hmm. Zero people have gotten sick. And I mean, fuck, dude. Do you know anyone that died of COVID? I do. I do. I, I know quite a bit. Let's hear about it then. Okay. Um, and I don't say that like like questioning. I mean, like who were these people? Are they old? Were they sick or sick? Sick or old for sure. I mean, if if you look at one, this I don't I mean I, I shouldn't speak on this because I don't know enough about it, but I have an idea. Uh, it's a little theory I have in my head that I found very interesting. Uh I believe it was Khabib Nergamanamenov's father died of COVID, yeah, correct? Yeah. Yep, right? Yep. Now if you look at that they they're from Dagestan, which is a small little mountain community segregated from the entire rest of the world. And all they do is they train and they train and they train. They're in incredible shape, just like it's uh, fucking bizarre, isn't right? It? Oh, it's so awesome. They found these people in the middle of the mountains that are the best fighters in the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then you got say uh, Hamza Chimaev. He almost died of COVID. It was hard on that dude. We don't. I mean, who knows when he's even going to be able to come back to fight again at 100%. That's right. I forgot They're still about talking that. about that. You know, like it hit him hard. And Hamzat, from what we've heard, is looking at being the most dominant possible UFC fighter in the history of the sport. And that's from Dana White. Dana said, this dude is he like has nobody something. else. Yeah. Like it's something special. Now, him being such a super athlete, Khabib's father being around wrestling his whole life, and I'm sure he was one hell of an athlete as well. Why did it affect these guys so much? My theory is they're not used to the exposure from other people, so their immune systems aren't as strong. Such an isolated culture. Correct. Yeah. So I think all these people that locked themselves up during the the lockdown and isolation of COVID did themselves a disservice. The people like me who was who were out every day, I was going on BMX rides with hundreds of people every single night. We were sharing joints, sharing drinks. Like uh-huh. nobody gave a shit. <laughs> yeah, good, dude. We were all fine. 
and, and, I, and you know what else, dude? This is what I kept telling people. If you did get sick and die, welcome to being a human being. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. People act like if you don't die of COVID, you're going to be immortal or something. <laughs> it's like if you hide from everything that's fucking dangerous, you're going to lock yourself in a room and you're not going to do jack shit. You know, oh, yeah. a guy that's splitting lanes on, on the I-5 <laughs> at 90 miles an hour, probably like you're a wild dude. I'm risking my life every day. So what the fuck are you? I'm, 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 I'm splitting lanes at 130 on the fucking <laughs> 405 to go to work to raw dog some girl that's sexually active to the next level. You know what I mean? Like, so my immune system is. I keep that motherfucker on its toes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Between rolling with dudes at jujitsu to rolling with chicks at porn, I mean, I'm, I'm, I got my immune system in full effect all the time. Yeah. And I think that's what gave me a barrier to something like a COVID. Um, do you still drink kombucha? I do. I love kombucha. I drink a lot of hard kombucha now. Because it's good for your skin. Is right? it? Right? Yeah. It's, it's supposed good for to, everything. It's supposed to be good for like... Uh, they say for fighting off like ringworm and staff and stuff like that. Really? The probiotics that are in it. So I remember, you remember? I know what you were saying. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think I just picked you guys up at the airport, right? Yeah. You flew into Seattle yeah. and we stopped yeah. and I grabbed a kombucha and when I opened it, it just exploded my whole car. Yep. And you were, it were sitting in my Mustang you were covered in kombucha. I'll never forget it. You look at me and you go, I now know what it feels like to be offended <laughs> <laughs> because I, I was looking straight forward at the road because I'm in a new place. I want to see what the fuck's going on. I'm not looking in your eyes. You're driving the, you're driving the car. Uh -huh. And then all I know is all of a sudden I'm sprayed in the face with this foot odor. <laughs> and I was like, what a fucking asshole. Like, did, like was that, is that how he rolls? Is like, it a, like it's just, a practical joke yeah, or something? Yeah, like, he thought that shit was funny. Like, he just sprayed, <laughs> like, some foot smell all over me. <laughs> it was brutal. Oh, fuck, dude. Uh, yeah, dude, I think uh, the whole reason I called you when I was coming down here, because I was like, dude, Charles has the wildest life out of, like, I think anyone I know. Really? Bro. That says a lot because you're a wild fucking dude. Well, bro, my I have tons of friends. Like I did a podcast this morning with a Navy SEAL who mm -hmm. has a bunch of deployments and all his friends are dead. Like that's wild in a, in its own sort, you know? Different, different wild. But yeah, you're wild. It's just like you've been doing whatever the fuck you want. Literally whatever you want since like the day I met you. <laughs> and dude, that's what everybody wants to do, but nobody does it. I think life's all about fighting for your freedom. And it, it, it I, I really do like, I feel like the most important thing to me every day is the freedom to do what the fuck I want to do. That's a good, that's a good call. Thank you. Yeah. But it's rad dude, because I think everybody wants to be doing what they want, but yeah. everybody's too intimidated or we get caught up in trying to own things and achieve things that we don't necessarily need. And we're doing to impress others. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's fucking pretty much our entire society. Yeah. And Instagram's not helping it. <laughs> I, but I think yeah. it is. Like, everyone's very negative on Instagram. I love it, but I'm very cautious of what I follow. Yeah. You know? I guess that's like anything in life. You can you can feed yourself whatever you want, right? Here you go. Ready? Ready? Yeah, this yeah. is so beautiful. It's my new mantra. I say it all the time, and I tell everybody. Everywhere you look, you will see what you're looking for. Yeah. That's from Ram Das. Ram Das is a brilliant philosopher, but it's so true. If you, and then he says, everywhere you look, you will see what you're looking for. If you're looking for God, all you'll see is God. Go buy a white car. All you'll see is white cars. Uh -huh. you know, like, yeah. The, it's, it's so true. Fuck man. I, I've actually been at kind of like, not a, not a crossroads, but just trying to redirect the energy of my life because the last year has been, there's been so much triggering shit happening, right? Mm -hmm. Like anytime you check any source of media, it's a lot of triggering shit. And then you're, you're allowing outside things to affect like how you feel internally. For instance. And for what? What are you following that is giving you these triggers? Or just for instance, like all the, uh, all the political stuff, like all the, all the, lockdowns or all the schools closed or the kids having to be masked up 
And it's like the shit that happens has been very frustrating to me is like, you know, just as like people were threatening to shut my business down and I was Correct. getting letters and phone calls. You're open. You were told to be closed. And it's like tons of triggering shit for day in and day out. But also like there's, I do feel like it's starting to kind of wane mm -hmm. all the shit that was happening. It doesn't seem like it's as prevalent, but I don't think I've detached from it emotionally. Like I'm, yeah. I still get angry about shit all the time. Well, it affects you a little more because you're way more of an adult than I am. <laughs> you've got a business, you've got kids. So like with the whole kids, just the kids thing alone, now they have to go to school. So all the, the, the curriculum is going to affect you. It's being taught in school. Yeah. The rules and regulations. Those are your kids. You really give a fuck. So, so yeah, you're always walking. I always say like, I have to balance between allowing this stuff to like, get me triggered or, or upset me. But at the same time, I can't just ignore it, put my head in the sand. I know. Cause I'm in this game. You know yes. what I'm saying? Like this is my life. And I, so I don't have much at stake in the game so it's easier for me to disconnect i feel yeah like i spend all day looking at like oh brad sims did a new bmx trick that's super cool let me see if i can go do something like that and that's <laughs> it that's that was like my day that's it Dude. i could give a fuck about anything else <laughs> that's so funny and then i'm like oh wait, look, there's this new girl in porn i'm gonna go fuck her and film it and then sell it on my only fans and uh you know what i need to eat more sushi i want to go get some sushi that's it. So you're just literally, <laughs> dude, you're living like a wild animal. Yeah. That's how an animal lives. I want to fuck. I'm going to fuck. <laughs> I get hungry. I go eat something. And I go ride shit. I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> dude, it's actually kind of fucking rad. Just try to keep your bills minimal, you know, and just do your thing. I remember you used to hate money. I, I know. I went through a phase where I hated money. Yeah. Like you didn't even believe in it. You didn't I even know. want any. You're like, yes. fuck money, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm still like that to a point, but... Dude, it's the reality of the world we live in. Yeah. If you want to go fucking heli skiing in Alaska, it takes some money. It takes quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I was I was super tripping the other day on a lot of acid. And I was sitting there and I was just like looking at people and I could see their energy levels within them. And then somehow my mind got caught into this thing of like, we're all like in this computer system. And all of us, our money level is our energy level. And the amount of money we have is the, the amount of energy we have to expel to do things. It was fucking crazy. It was just like super trippy hole I got into. I just kept spiring deep. So it made sense at the time. Do you feel like it was telling you that having money is actually not a bad thing? It kind of gives you opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, money will give you the opportunity to go back to the word I said earlier, freedom. Yes. Money provides freedom. 100%. To me. Dude. It, it all depends on how you use it. You can use it to buy shit that's going to get you locked into a bunch of fucking shit you don't want to do, or you can yep. use it to buy your freedom. What are you going to do? Yeah. And I mean, that's like, like we bought that property. Next time you come up, I can't wait to show it to you. Oh, dude. yeah. It's 30 acres out in the mountains oh, with, shit. with a river that goes through it. That's beautiful. And it's, you go out there and. You were, the driveway is one mile. Holy shit. So you're fucking, I mean, the, the, the neat thing about it, it's only a couple minutes out of town. Yeah. But then you have a one mile driveway. It's, there's no other houses at the end, no other neighbors. That's it. There's just one mile to my property. How many acres is it? 30. 30. Okay. And like you get out there and it's just, it just feels like freedom. Why did you want to buy that land? So that's an interesting question because- with all the uncertainty in the world right now, I was thinking like, what could, if, if we needed, if I needed to just take my family and just disappear, get away from everything, break away from society, what would we need? And we started looking and this place offers everything like a good water source. And it's like, it's very flat. There's a lot of like areas where you could build and stuff. So we want to go out there and actually build cabins and make like a little community out there. But here's the cool thing. If the world is good and things fucking continue to improve, we're going to Airbnb it. And bro, Airbnb is a huge industry right now. I know they're so expensive right now. And bro, like this is also on, uh, out in Washington state, it's on mountain loop highway, which is like one of the biggest hiking destinations in Washington state. Wow. And we check some of the local Airbnbs and they're booked for like a year out. Holy shit. So we're like, you know what? If if life is good, then it'll be a good source of income. And if fucking we ever need, 
we have a place we can disappear out in the woods. Why is it since COVID hit, everything is, it's become so much harder to find places to live, whether you want to rent a place, buy a place over, it seems like our population has increased. I don't know, man. I haven't, like, like I haven't had to deal with that at all. Okay. So I, I was in the process of buying a house. And of course we all know what real estate's through the roof right now to it's, buy anyway. It's fucking insane right, right now. Now, even to rent a place is so fucking hard. Airbnbs. I wanted to rent an Airbnb for a month in Huntington Beach. The cheapest I could find, you ready for this, was nine thousand dollars like, <sighs> for a house. Nine thousand dollars to rent one a house month. for a month. I'm like, how how did this happen overnight? Like, where is all this people coming from that are renting these that are putting the price through the roof that weren't there before? Yeah, no, it doesn't really make sense. It makes no sense, especially in California because a lot of people left California over the last year. And it doesn't look like it's me. <laughs> no, dude. When I was walking around Venice today, it was like, it, I thought there was a concert. Yeah. I'm serious. Because I walk up and I could hear like a guy on a microphone and I, and I looked to my right because I walked in from some side streets. And then when I got to, what's it called? The boardwalk or whatever, where mm. everyone's riding their bikes and their skateboards, I look up and it looked like a rock concert because it was that everybody was just packed in shoulder to shoulder, like sardines. And then I started listening and the guy was like some fucking street worker, like telling or doing magic tricks or something. That's it. <laughs> you know? And, and so the crowd wasn't there for him. That was just the crowd today. That's crazy. And maybe it's just cause everybody's, I don't know, like the, the lockdowns, they probably affect California very differently than most places. Oh, like I, my, so my mom was in Philadelphia. She's like 72. And she, she calls me up during the whole COVID thing, and she's like, oh, my God, how, what is it like over there? I, I watch the news, and I see people being taken out in body bags, and I'm like, nah, <laughs> life is good. It's, nothing's changed. It's another day in Huntington Beach. Like, I, I don't see any of that. And the same thing here now. They're talking about, like, this new Delta variant, and everything's so bad. No, you just went out to look like a rock concert for some dude doing magic tricks in the park. Like, yeah, yeah. Everybody's fine. Everybody, yeah, life is completely normal. What are you talking about? But then it's it's everywhere you look, you see what you're looking for. Yeah. So if you're a person that lives by the news and the media and you're connected to that, yeah, that, that's bullshit sells. Misery sells. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear, well, today was a sunny day and nothing bad happened and everyone had a good time. And Charles Dara enjoyed riding his BMX through Huntington Beach, California. Nobody wants to hear that <laughs> shit. Yeah. No, that's funny, man. Did you see any of the, like, were the cops getting involved with the COVID shit? Did you see any of that shit, like, initially? Because, um, I mean, that's what was getting me fired up. That's what made me make the video. Yeah, I know. Made my whole fucking life change, you right? know? Yeah. But I know LA County was dealing with a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. Like, task force going in and, like, shutting down parties and stuff like that. Crazy. But was that shit happening in Huntington? Um, I don't know. I have no idea. I was just all over the place. I'm going to be a mess. I'm just so detached from what the fuck everyone else does. I don't know. I could care less. Uh, well, fuck dude. We're already 28 minutes into it. And I wanted you, you have a fucking interesting life story, dude. Thank you. Like, I like you tell me about like when you went into the military and you were in Japan and then you went into porn and it's like, nobody has lived that fucking life. And that's why I was like, dude, I want to get Charles on here. Tell his fucking story, dude. So you grew up in Philadelphia. Grew up in uh, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. It's right outside of Philadelphia, and it's a, like a suburban area. Lots of uh, parks, rivers, right outside of the cities. You know, right where the suburbia starts. That's where I came from. It was your childhood. Fucking your childhood was kind of crazy, right? It wasn't too crazy. I mean, I, I had great grandparents, but my parents they weren't too active in my life. My father was an alcoholic, so we spent most of his time in and out of prison for not paying child support, which is kind of fucked. So, ladies, 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 if you're out there listening, <laughs> yeah. if you marry a man, and the same goes for the guys, if you marry a woman. You took a vow to stay with them through sickness, through health, whatever the fucking vows are. I don't know. But you should <laughs> stick to that motherfucker. Stick to them. Don't just go running out because, oh, he's an alcoholic. Like, no, stick to him. You, you made that. Anyway, I got it. Yeah, yeah, but, but you, we also said, like, nothing should be permanent, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, that's why I don't get married. Yeah, you know what I mean? No, you're I'm right. Yeah, yeah. Make, I'm not ready to make that commitment like that. To, to death do you part to death do you part that's that's, a, but that not that a strange thing that we tell ourselves 
it's like, hey, it's not until you're better off without that person. Yeah. Or you guys uh, are actually kind of toxic together, so maybe you you should separate. No, you're going to die together. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just recently broke up with my girlfriend after 14 years. Uh-huh. And it wasn't my choice. She just kind of wanted to find herself. She's been with me since she was 19 years old. We've been together the whole time, and we had a great relationship, but- I grew one way, she grew the other. 14 years is a long time. Yeah. You know, and she wanted to find out who she was and stop living underneath the Charles Darrow umbrella. Yeah. You know? And I get it. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, it's not a problem. I'm going to miss you. It sucks. You know, like, but you got to choose you. You can't choose me. I understand. So you just moved out then? Is just, that? Yeah, I just moved out. Man, let's see. On one hand, like, that feels kind of sad. Yeah, yeah, but. Because like, Sue Ann's fucking cool chick. She's, she, I love her to death. You know, She's the best. I have no complaints, you know, but also like you got to do you. She's got to do her. That's what I'm saying. That's you know? what I mean. Yeah. yeah like yeah, I'm not, I don't want her to sit here and resent me cause I kept her hostage. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And, and a lot of people want that. They would rather somebody stay with them just to, for their own ego and their mm-hmm. own desires. Even if that person is like better off moving on. Yeah. Or needs to for their own personal reasons. For sure. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't want someone who's resenting me to stay with me. That no. Sucks. Yeah. It's gross, right? Gross. It's gross. The one thing that is cool about marriage is like it does, at least with me and Jenny, just like you said, like stick it out. Because mm-hmm. as you know, and we're not going to get into all the details, but me and Jenny went through some crazy shit in our relationship. Of course. You know, but we fucking stuck it out. Yeah. And we're probably, I think we're the best we've ever been now. That's awesome. I'm and so it, glad to hear that. Yeah, And it's cool, right? But you have to realize like any relationship, there's an ebb and flow to it. Mm-hmm. And there always will be. Even with my male relationships. Yeah, of course. Like, dude, Joe Al and I are like brothers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We butt heads multiple times. We've had it out and we just stick it out. You yeah. Know? I mean, I don't agree with him all the time. He doesn't agree with me, but you, it's my brother. You stick it out. It's family. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's, that's what family does. <laughs> yeah. It's cool, man. But, uh, yeah. And I, I give Jenny more of the credit than me, but she's like, no, we're sticking through this. That's we're, awesome. we're not getting divorced. We're going to figure this out. You're going to fucking sit down and you're going to listen to me. And like, m- Saw it from her perspective. Good for her. You know, and then we we went, we fought through all of the issues we were having. But I also think it's kind of a, I also have a, like, you know, the people that never fight. Mm-hmm. Do you, have you ever, do you have any friends where it's yeah. like, I have one guy that I, I used to work with. He's like, me and my wife haven't had an argument in 20 years. And I'm like, she must be like your slave then or something, yes. right? Or vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's exactly right. But I don't want, somebody that's not going to challenge you or put you in check when you need to be correct. Like you, but also I don't want drama. No, There's no ways yeah. to do it. No, it's a balancing act. Right. Yeah. But just like you said, like you and Joe out head sometimes, but that's probably a good thing. Like you want friends that are going to call you on shit. Like for instance, Joe, you're supposed to be here today. Mm-hmm. And in true Brazilian fashion at seven sixteen, he goes, Hey bro, I don't think I can make it today. I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just busting your balls, dude. You do you, right? He's had a long day sitting around. He needs a rest. <laughs> Actually, I think he was coaching at a, <laughs> at a jiu-jitsu tournament. And bro, doesn't coaching wear you out? Yeah. Those are some of the longest days ever because oh. you're just standing. And I, then you're leaning on that fence. There's something about the energy of a tournament that's exhausting. If you go as a spectator, I'm exhausted. Isn't that bizarre? It's just this, you know, it's, you're in a room, like, let's say we'll take a tournament. We'll say, uh, like, you're not even a big one, like a national tournament. The amount of competitors, say there's 500 competitors that day. They're all stressed the fuck out. You don't think that energy wears off on you? Yeah. yeah. There's no, no you're, fighter. Yeah, you're right. You're feeling that. Any fighter that tells you he doesn't feel stressed before the fight is full of fucking shit. Uh-huh. We all do. Right? Except the Iceman. <laughs> 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 He's banging hookers and snorting right. blow before the fight, dude. But yeah, everyone has to do something to stay stress fucking free. And you know, it, it's it, if you don't, if you're not stressed about it, it's because you don't give a fuck. Yeah. We're all stressed to a point. I'm not saying it's got to be unhealthy stress, but yeah, it, it, it's certainly on your mind, you know? Well, when I told you we were walking in here and I told you Joe Al wasn't joining us tonight and you said, that's why you don't set expectations on people. 
He yeah. goes, that's the, you said that's the best way to maintain your happiness. Yep. And I was like, dude, that's some fucking Charles Derrick gold. Save that for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Zero expectations and you'll never be let down. Yeah. You know? And I mean, it's exactly like you said, when we were walking in, you said, well, it's not, it's not a, a necessarily like a realistic way to live. Cause you have to have a, if you're something, yeah, somewhat. on some things you have to, like if I'm going to, if I'm supposed to pick you up at the airport, you're flying up to Seattle to see me and then I yeah. just don't show up. Hey man, sorry. I'm out to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> no show, no call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, you have to have some expectations, but like overall, I would say, I would agree with that. The less that you have, the happier you're going to be. Yeah. Cause and it, there's some people that put expectations on you about everything. Correct. And the worst ones are sometimes they don't even tell you. Mm -hmm. They're like these weird, they just develop these expectations, hoping you'll do this or thinking you should do that. And you don't even really know it. Yeah. And then they're, they feel let down by you mm. and it's fucking, I don't know, man, that's the fucking world we live in. Can't please everybody. Oh, I was just saying that this morning. Like if you try and please everybody, you end up pleasing nobody. Yeah. You know? So there's a part of you that just has to know, like, dude, some people fuck them. Like you're not going to be aligned with them. So fuck them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So then you went in the fucking Marine Corps right out of high school. Yeah, I was in. I was always in trouble in high school. I uh, I was running credit card scams. I was stealing motorcycles. <laughs> I... <laughs> See, dude, yeah. like uh, I didn't know anything about this stuff. So oh, let's yeah. hear about it, dude. I, dude I, I was always getting in trouble. Like I I used to work at a gas station. <laughs> And this was back in the day, like in the late nineties. Uh huh. And you know, credit card numbers are sixteen digit numbers. So I'm not saying I did this, but people I knew did this just for legality reasons. We're gonna make up a name and say his name was <laughs> Bruce. Yeah, and, fuck Bruce. <laughs> yeah. Bruce would run a sixteen digit credit card number with the expiration date and then just go and pull that cash out of the shift and he would do that all the time and that was one way. So yeah, we were always getting in trouble, you know. So um did you, were you one of the guys that got in trouble and they said either join the Marine Corps or you're going to jail? Yes. Okay. That was me. Dude, I've heard that story. I, I tell that story a lot because some of the best Rangers I know. Oh, yeah. Were in the military because of that. Yeah. That must have been a Northeast thing, huh? Maybe. Maybe. Because I'm my buddy that I'm thinking about was from Boston. He beat up a Boston police officer. Oh, that's fucking bad yeah. news. like you're going to jail or you're going into the Army. So he was 17 years old and fucked up a grown man? <laughs> yeah, dude. He's a fucking rugby player. He's a savage. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I always joke that he's the toughest untrained man I know. Wow. He doesn't do martial arts, yeah. but you don't want to fight him. That's awesome. You know, some guys are just like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So then, I, so tell me about that then. You literally got arrested and you're standing before judge. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I was a snowboarder too. And I think the, the, well, the icing on the cake was I went on a school field trip and I stole a snowboard and I threw it underneath the bus and then the bus got pulled over by the police and they pulled everybody off and it was, it was just all bad news. And, uh, yeah, they were like, you know, either you join the Marine Corps or you go to jail or they said join the service. And I wanted to be a Marine because in my mind, no offense. <laughs> yeah. The Marines was the best. It was uh -huh. the hardest and the most that I achieved to. Little did I know the Marines was the poorest. Uh -huh. If I could do it again, I would have been like, I'm going to go in the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> like, go fucking get a nice apartment and chill out. Yeah, they got good money. You know what I mean? Good benefits. So it's way better. <laughs> so if you're out there and you're thinking of joining the service, go with the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I went with the Marines and um, I didn't love it because I wanted a challenge and I didn't find my challenge there. Your military experience was like polar opposite of mine. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was 17 years old when, when I, when I signed up, I didn't know what I wanted and everyone stressed to me. I'm not, I shouldn't make an excuse and put it on other people, but they made it so important of what are you going to do when you get out? What are you going to do when you get out? Yeah. For me, it was more important of what am I going to do in that's what I should have focused on. Not when I got out because all I wanted to do was kill people. Like, what are you, <laughs> what are you in the Marine Corps? I just want to shoot people. Yeah, I want to go to true. war. I want to yeah. be a savage. I want that life. But instead I listened to my elders, which I should have never done. My biggest mistakes in life were listening to other people all the time. <laughs> oh, dude, and they there's were so many little bugging gold <laughs> nuggets in here. Like, yeah, like, listening to other people. Like, fuck them. Like they're not me. They don't think like me. I'm not a basic person. I, I don't want a job, you know? Yeah. So what did I do? I became an aviation mechanic and immediately I got to boot camp. And I learned about Marine force recon and I'm like, Whoa, that's what, what I want to be. Yeah. What the fuck did I do? What did I do? I want to be, I want to be a grunt. I want to be in the infantry. These guys are the shit. 
Did I get to do it? Nope. So I go to aviation school and I failed out of it <laughs> horribly. And I did it on purpose. Like yeah, I was I make me a grunt, please. Yeah. I had perfect PFT scores. Like my ASVAB was really good. Uh-huh. But I was like, I don't want to do this. They're like, Nope, too late. You're here. You're going to do it. So I failed out all the fucking schools. I would, I, then I got sent to Okinawa, Japan and they fapped me out. Do you know what that means to be fapped out? No, I thought fapping was like jerking <laughs> off. <laughs> it is today. I don't think it was back when, okay. in the, the early 2000s when I was in the Marine Corps. But I, I was sent into like this special unit that was in charge of bullshit. So I was on the corrosion control assistance team. So I was in got, Okinawa, Japan. Correct. What what corrosion were you controlling? <laughs> <laughs> I would walk up to like CH forty sixes, I CH fifty threes. Yeah, you know, and I would do an inspection. I was nineteen years old, and <laughs> I'm looking at some officers like fucking aircraft. I'm like, there was some rust on here. There's some rust on there. We're gonna we're gonna ground this, and we're gonna scrub the rust off. Then I would bring my team, and I was a corporal at the time. I get promoted quickly because my PFT scores were so good, <laughs> and we would scrub the rust off the fucking plane. But the job sucked. It's not, and dude, there's you didn't no, want to, you didn't want to do that for the rest of your life. No, no, there, there's no, uh, what's it called? A runway. There's no runway that's not cold as hot or, or cold as fuck, hot as fuck, or windy as fuck. Yeah, yeah it's for the sure, most miserable environment. It's loud. You're breathing in it jet smells fuel. Smells like JP8 all the time. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. the worst environment for a guy like me to be. In. I don't want to be there. It sucks. You know, I want to do something <laughs> fun. So. They would work me 12 hours a day. I'm constantly working. Then I would come home. I get white glove inspections on my fucking room. And mind you, at night, that's when I got into doing live sex shows. Uh-huh. In Okinawa. <laughs> there was a place called the Naha Stage Show. And it was in the military. had been to Okinawa and knows about the Naha Stage Show. <laughs> and three times a month, they would get new girls in. And I would go every fucking time they get new girls in. They would bring in two new Colombian girls. And they would have Asian girls come out and strip. And I'd go up there and I'd, they, they'd say, we need a volunteer. And I was volunteer and I would bind up fucking the Colombian girls. So, so, the, so how did that happen the first time? You're like, you're a spectator, obviously. They told me about it and they said, well, if you raise your hand and volunteer, you can fuck the girls. Like the, the guys on base told me. I'm like, I'm there. Let's go. Let's go. Like immediately. <laughs> it was, I think it was like $35 to get in. Uh huh. And then you can, and you don't even tip. It was weird. Like, it was like a tipping thing. And you just hang out and you can fuck the girls. So I started getting into it. I think by the time I left Okinawa, I had fucked like 40 prostitutes <laughs> and like one real girl in life. <laughs> <laughs> one real girl. One real girl. One girl that actually said yes, not for money. And then the rest were all prostitutes. And I was like, whoa, I like this. I'd rather fuck prostitutes than date girls. This is way cooler. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, so that's what got you down the path going into down the, industry. the path yeah, down the path well because from there i went into chippendales and then i just lived on tour with the homies and it was always cool because you're traveling the world with your homies you know i love be- i'm a guy right. i remember you telling me about that like some of those dudes were fucking rad some were super fucking rad i looked up to them like big brothers and other guys liked attention and that's not my my cup of tea you know i like dudes that just want to hang out with the homies bang chicks and make money so you went you got out of the military. So came I came back home. So I went AWOL. So check it out. So I was. <laughs> Dude, I love it. The story just keeps getting better. I got stationed in Newburgh, New York. It's like upstate New York. It's uh, uh, It was like an Air Force base, but I worked there as a Marine. And that was after. So you're. After Okinawa. It was, okay. It was my first like spot after Okinawa. I was supposed to be there for like the rest of my term. Uh, I was already like three years into my five year contract. Uh huh. Uh, and I get there, and it, I hated the job. They were working me 12 hours a day, coming home to white glove inspections, and they were all fucking fat, overweight dudes that c- couldn't run a PFT nearly to save their lives. You know what I mean? They were just Faggots. miserable. <laughs> they were what? Faggots. Yes. I'm bringing the word back. Yes. <laughs> Bring it back. They were a bunch of fags. I don't hang out with these dudes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, So I would look at the guys that were older than me, and I thought, do I want to be like them? You're like, no, no. not at all. I, they, they didn't inspire me. So I was, I went back home to Philly one weekend and uh, I was walking down South street and there was this like high fashion store there. And this dude worked at a place called Missouri and it's probably still there. His name was Daryl Matthews. And he comes up to me and he goes, Hey man, he was super cool. Like good vibes I got from this guy. He goes, you're, you're a really good looking guy. You should be a model. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah, you should be a model here. Call my buddy. His name's Angelo. He lives in New York city. He'll get you started. And I went to New York, like my next day off, went to fucking New York City, 
and uh, met with some agents. And then I started. And next thing you know, I'm like working on the side as a model during the day and then stripping at night. I would work at all these like different strip clubs and shit to make money. And I was making like really good money compared to the Marines. Yeah. Like I'm sitting here around the Marines. Bro, there's no money in the military. There's no money. They're worried about white glove inspections and they're all sitting around waiting for their fucking welfare check. Uh-huh. And this is my biggest complaint about the military too. They encourage you 18 year old kids to get married and That's then have fucking, kids. Yeah. It's so you know how that yeah, is. Yeah, dude. Because then you're, you're trapped. Now yep. you're not going to leave. So I fucking... I was like, dude, no way. I'm done. I went AWOL. And I started you know, working with fucking people from Calvin Klein. Like, I, I was doing great. I was having so much fun. I was like, what the fuck? So they said, you, if you go AWOL, you never have a government job. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want- give a fuck <laughs> yeah. about a government job. So, yeah, 21 years old. Like, I'm, I'm about to be a supermodel. I don't want to be a fucking government job. I'm good, dude. I'm gone. And uh, I left. And then I went to fucking Manhattan. I was working as a model all day. And at night, I met with the company Chippendales. They had a show there. So I would wait tables at Chippendales at night. Then they asked me if I wanted to go on the world tour. Then I started touring the world with Chippendales as their MC. And I became the, the Chippendales MC on the world tour. Then they offered me a full-time job in Las Vegas. So I moved to Las Vegas. What, dude, what was the world tour like? Are you literally like a rock star, like on a bus? Absolutely. City to city? Yep. And what, what were the shows like? <sighs> we would probably have between 600 and 4,000 girls a night. That's fucking nuts, dude. Awesome. And everyone's like, oh, Chip and Dale's a bunch of old ladies. No, what old ladies want to go out to a fucking club like that? None. It's it's usually young, hot chicks that want to party and have fun. Uh-huh. So we would party with the girls every single night. And mind you, at the time, I didn't eat, I, I, I was straight edge. I wasn't into drugs or alcohol or any of that shit. So I was sober throughout the whole time, but I was always the wild one, the one to look out for because I would always get into fights. Little things would take me off. And I had a lot to prove at the time. You know, uh, well, because I wasn't the smartest. In their early 20s. Especially dudes like us. We're a yeah, little different. Yeah, dude. You but know? you're full of testosterone. Yeah. And <laughs> you're feeling wild. Like, wild. <laughs> that's fucking awesome, dude. You want to leave your mark, you know? Uh huh. So, how long were you on that? How long was that tour? I, multiple tours. We would go on tour for three months at a time, okay. come back, that would be in the Vegas show, then i go out another three months at a time. I, but I saw the world all over Europe, South Africa. We went to uh, Mexico, all over the place. Dude, that's dude. better than the military. <laughs> Way better. <laughs> you're, seeing, you're seeing the whole world and just hanging out with hot chicks every night. And partying and being treated with respect. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was really, really nice. And I'm... Did you ever hear anything again from the Marine Corps? Nope. Like a again. letter or something? Like, hey, you better come back. Oh, oh so I, I turned myself in. Because what I did is I researched it before I just went AWOL. And I'm, I figured, how can I do this to expedite the process so I don't fuck myself up? So I knew you had to be, I think, 28 days or 30 days you have to be missing before you get before it becomes AWOL. Isn't that the way it works? I don't remember. I don't know what the, the days are, but... It's 28 to 30 days. I can't remember what it was before. It's now like not just a, a loss of absence, but then you become absolutely AWOL, and now it's like really a punishable offense. So I waited till like those days were up. I think I was gone for six weeks. And then I went and I drove my truck down to Quantico, Virginia, because I know that's Marine Corps base headquarters. Because if I were just to get arrested, there would be a there would be a warrant out for my arrest. And if I were to get pulled over for a ticket, they would arrest me. Say I got arrested in Philadelphia, then I would have to get arrested and spend yeah. time in jail until they can ship me to <laughs> yeah. Quantico. And I'm like, that's not going to be fun. So I turned myself into Quantico. I go, hey, I've been AWOL. And they said, cool. They brought me in. They put me in charge of a working party. I was a corporal at the time. And I, I was in charge of the working party for six weeks. I got out, and that was it. I got oh, other, so the, other they just, honorable. The next six weeks was them just basically out processing you, processing me out. They yeah. just agreed, like, all right, we're fucking. And they put me in charge of like working camps. I'd make other guys work. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty interesting. I figured the Marine Corps would be like, nope, fuck you, you know. But I also never heard about people doing hard time. What are you in for? Yeah. I went AWOL. Yeah. Like a lot of the military is like fear driven tactics. Mm-hmm. You know? It's just like I mean, I went to the recruiter the other day with Zach. Remember Zach who we climbed Vesper Peak with? Oh yeah. So he wants to go in the Air Force. Or the smart. Yeah, the smart one, right? <laughs> and there was like a, a sign on the wall that's like, if you're not honest with your recruiter, it's punishable by ten thousand dollars and however many years in jail. And I look up and I tell the recruiter, I said, there's lots of guys doing hard time for not being honest with you, huh? <laughs> and he laughs. He goes, nah, it's just, it's just something on the wall that kind of 
scare people into telling us the truth. <laughs> he Same. like straight up called it out. And I'm like, yeah, I know. That's Same what, thing cops do. Yeah, of course. Dude. You know how it is. Like, hey, do you mind if I look around the car? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah motherfucker, I do. I yeah, do. You, you can't, but nobody realizes that. They just go, oh, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, dude, like, I tell everybody, if the cops ever want to know anything, I don't care if you're even innocent lawyer. Yeah. You know, I have nothing. If you're asking me questions about anything, I have to assume that I'm potentially the one that's being looked at for something. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, you know what, man? I know how this game is played. I got to talk to my lawyer before I talk to you. Yeah. Period. About anything, you know? But yeah, you're right. People get fucking like, you see it all the time on these police shows. <laughs> they're like, people don't know their rights at all. No. And they're just self-incriminating why, the fuck out of themselves. Why don't dude. we get taught that in school? <laughs> yeah, right. right. You think the system's going to teach you yeah. how to beat the system? They should teach you your rights in school. <laughs> that seems like something very important. If if we're all about freedom and human rights and our right for this, and our right for, teaching my fucking rights in school. Yeah. But as George Carlin said, You don't have any rights. (laughs) (laughs) That's right, dude. Oh, fuck. So then after, I mean, was Chippendales in Vegas? That was like your last stint with them, right? Correct. Yeah. And how was that, dude? It was cool. It wasn't my favorite thing. I mean, my heart was always, I just wanted to be a fighter. On tour? Oh, okay. I wanted to be a fighter. So the major reason I wanted to move to Vegas was so I could get to train in some of the biggest fight gyms, and I did, and I would train all day and then just go to Chippendales and I had to pay the the bills. It wasn't my gig. It wasn't my happy place. It was a job. It was, it was a good job and it was better than anything else I could do, but, uh, yeah, it wasn't where my heart was now. So when you went to, when you decided you want to be a fighter, was that like, what, what sparked that? My whole life I wanted to be a fighter. It just didn't exist for me back then. I mean, I'm a 42 year old guy and yeah, the, UFC the, the was UFC just, was just burgeoning, you know? Yeah. It was crazy back then. It's like, you had a dude like Hoyce Gracie, like, and I would think I could never be a black belt in jujitsu. I could never be that guy. You know, it's just, it was so far out of touch. Out yeah. of reach. You know, it's funny if, if either one of us were to go back to UFC one, mm-hmm. you'd be the champion. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Maybe like <laughs> possibly. I, it's well, hard bro, to because tell. Those I mean, dudes are, dude, even though those dudes were studs. No, they were fucking tough. But my point is like, just on a skill level, skill level, like yeah. nobody was training everything. No, you didn't have a dude that was a black belt in jujitsu. Like no. both of we, both of us are. Yeah. And then also knows Muay Thai. Yeah. Those people didn't exist, you for know? Sure. For sure. And that's what's so cool about seeing the evolution of the sport. So when you, what year was it then when you were training in Vegas? 2003 to oh. like 2000, probably nine. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimate fighter was oh five, I think. Right. Yeah. You know, I was the very first guy picked for the ultimate fighter. I didn't, I have no idea. Tell me, I can't wait to hear about you it. You didn't though. know about this? No, dude. Yeah. So I, I, I was training out of John Lewis and Skipper Kelp's gym. It was called J sect Las Vegas. And it was the number one school in the country at the time. I mean, Tito Ortiz was training out of there. Chuck Liddell, BJ Penn, Randy Couture, everybody. Those were the guys at the time would come there to train and work with John and work with Skip. Skip is actually now Dana White's private boxing coach. Like Skip, he's he's UNLV head boxing coach as well. He's not just some dude. He's an incredible coach. Uh huh. Taught me so much about boxing and hands. But anyway, um, it was when the whole idea of the Ultimate Fighter came around. They pitched me to to the show, and I was the first guy selected on the show. And uh, at the same time, I got offered the Chippendale job full time because I didn't have the full time Vegas job yet. Oh, okay. And like a fool, I listened to others again, and I went with the Chippendale job and kicked myself after that for the rest of my life. I'm still kicking myself. I would be in like. 7-Eleven and I see a, a Mickey's bottle and I see with fo- Forrest Griffin with on Forrest it. Forrest Griffin on it. And I'm like, fuck, dude. Forrest was my homie. We used to train together all the time, you know? And I'm like, fuck. I, I could be that, on this Mickey's bottle. Yeah, that could yeah. have been me living the life I wanted to be for the guy, like proud of what I do. I wasn't proud of being a Chippendale. Uh-huh. So I, I did it because it was money. That's all the reason I did. That's why I was so anti-money for a long time. Because all the decisions I was making were money-based. Yeah. They weren't passion-based. So you resented money I re- then. And I re- So I became to resent money because I was so mad at myself for choosing the money over my passions. And a, a thing I came up with a long time ago is follow, uh, follow your passions and the money will come. Mm-hmm. Don't ever do anything because you think it's going to be the financially best interest in you. Do what you love. The money will come. Trust me. Bro, I like that you said that because 
I've went back and forth on this topic because when I first, I was like, you know what? Fuck law enforcement. I'm going to do jujitsu full time. Mm -hmm. And I tried it and then I was going into debt, dude. Yep. Into debt. And I was struggling and I, I was, we talked about yeah, this, bro. And then I was like, it made me start to resent jujitsu a little bit. Cause I was like, God damn it, dude. I got to fucking, I got to go back to being a cop again. And so I did, but I also, I just don't think I was ready to mm -hmm. run the gym the way that a gym needs to be ran Correct. to be successful. It goes back to what we were talking about. It's like fighters don't pay your bills. And initially coming from electric and just get my black belt from Joe Hawasis is like, dude, I want to build a team of murderers. And like, yep. that's why it never worked. That never will work. Mm -hmm. You have to, as an owner, you have to have the jujitsu's for everyone approach. And it's like, if you don't have that, then you can have your team of 10 killers, but that's not paying your mortgage. No. You know? But maybe eventually will. Like, look at John Danaher. Yeah. He excelled at being that guy. You know, you'll be successful at anything as long as you give yourself to it completely. Mm -hmm. And the universe always gives us what we need, not what we want. You got to the point where you have a fully functioning running school now. It wasn't the path and the way you thought you would get there, but you did. Yeah. Because you never gave up on it and you kept pushing and excelling. You know, it, we, we all get to whatever we put our energy into. Yeah, for sure, dude. So then you took that gig and then you watched the we'll ultimate fighter blow the ultimate, up, yep. dude. But I'm going to, I'm going to be honest. I was, I was nervous. I knew I was going to be fighting Diego Sanchez. And at the time he was king. Oh, of the you were going to be, you were going to go into the lighter weight division then, huh? 185. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was always, I always fought middleweight. I'm not that big. Yeah. Yeah. For some reason, I was thinking you'd be at the 205ers. No, you know? no. Um, yeah, Diego Sanchez was a fucking murderer back dude, then. Dude, he still is. Yeah. That's Diego yeah, Sanchez. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. got more fights than the OC than anybody. Yeah. Like, that's, so, yeah, like, he, and I was like, fuck, man. Like, I was nervous because at that time, I hadn't even had a pro fight. And I'd only been training jujitsu for a few months. Oh, shit. So, so I was early on. Real early. And I was just gung ho. And everyone around me would tell me, you're too old. You're too, I was 23. You're too old. You're too old. <laughs> because the guys I'd be training, I mean, to 23 to start, it is old. Mm -hmm. It yeah. really is. Because I'm going against dudes that were high school wrestling champions. They had a pedigree. I didn't have shit. Yeah. I'd ridden a BMX bike as a kid. That's all I had. You know what I mean? Like, I was a naturally talented athlete, but I wasn't trained. Yeah, but the thing is, you if you remember season one, it was Josh Koscheck, Kenny Flo or Kenny Florian. Yep, I'll tell you everybody. Chris Lieben. Yep. Um, a bunch of guys that didn't win that made went careers. on to have great careers inside the octagon. Don't remind me, dude, you're rubbing me. <laughs> <What the> fuck? <laughs> yeah. No, you know what? You're right. Yeah. Diego Sanchez may have smashed you and that would have been the end of it. <laughs> yeah, who knows? You don't yeah. know. And, there and was, I was a couple embarrassed. Yeah. And I do it was so new that I knew Chuck Liddell was going to be part of it, and I knew Chuck Liddell from the gym. That's right. It was Chuck and Randy Chuck were the Randy. first coaches. And I was like, and from what my understanding was, I would have to fight them. And I'm like, holy fuck, I can't, I can't fight Chuck Liddell. Like, uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like, I'm never going to beat up Chuck Liddell. This sucks. Like, <laughs> but that was a loser's mindset. Yeah. I didn't have a winner's mindset. My mind wasn't in the right place. I didn't know how to be a professional athlete. I didn't know how to believe in myself. Now I do, of course. Yeah, but yeah. Back then I did not. So it's like you said, though, the universe doesn't give you what you want. It gives you what you need. Correct. You weren't ready for it. I wasn't. Uh huh. And and, and, and I'll tell people fighting is something, if you're not ready for it, like it's going to be a fucking problem. Yeah. You can't, that's not something you can dabble in. You know, I tell people, oh, oh, dude, it drives me nuts. I meet all these young dudes. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to train for a fight and, you know, I want to try it. I'm like, no fighting like you just said you don't dabble in it there's savages that all they want to do is break you the fuck off so uh -huh. they can move ahead yeah. and i've seen it and dudes lose without the, the, you, you'll take your fucking teeth like it's no joke but then you did keep fighting then or you started fighting still just fighting like local like, yeah, amateur yeah, stuff local circuits no, I, but I, dude i was started fighting before amateur even existed so i, <laughs> I, I immediately went to the pro fights and, okay you know i had like a 50 50 record because i didn't train regularly i would just train for fights i'd be like, oh six weeks out i'm gonna start training for a fight i didn't understand that you gotta have a lifestyle of training all the fucking time you yeah know? you got guys so, like gsp that yeah. haven't missed a day in yeah. two decades so I, I went like 50 50 in my fight career i just wasn't completely focused uh-huh but dude i met so many great people along the way i mean i worked with uh, the hector pena boss rutin 
You know, the list goes, oh, Rafael Cordero. The list goes on and on. Yeah, I, I can't thank these guys enough for the amount of knowledge they've instilled in me and taught me. And it, I, I've lived quite an amazing fight life. And it's the thing I'm most proud of in my entire life. It's it's who I am as a person, I think. I, I love hanging out around the fighters. That's my community. Well, and I think, I think every man should learn how to fight. Yeah. You know, like man, woman, child, everybody. Yeah. You should know how to fight. Yeah. And and like I said, you don't dabble in fighting, meaning I don't think you should go take cage fights if you're not going to take it serious. Yeah. But you should be in the gym. You should learn how to fight Yeah, because it'll change your life, dude. Yeah. It'll change how people interact with you. It'll change the energy people give you. That's what makes Huntington beach. Like most of the people in Huntington beach train and martial arts at some level. Uh That's why Huntington's known for, it's street fights. You come down to Huntington and you run your mouth off at a bar, some dude's going to knock you the fuck out. Well, dude, kind of, kind I, of like going to Texas. Everybody has a gun. <laughs> yeah. Nobody does anything stupid because everybody's got a fucking gun. You know, like. Well, bro, I tell people all the time, I lived in Huntington for a year. In my apartment, we'd walk right down to that main strip there where, uh, what is it, BJ's? Mm-hmm. The restaurant there on the corner. Yep. And, uh, dude, I never had anybody, like, get stupid or, like, puff up on me or talk shit like ever Mm -hmm. everybody was always cool as fuck dude and i remember thinking like dude huntington has a reputation for being like a bunch of badasses and everybody's nice as shit here (laughs) but that's why right yeah because it's like (laughs) texas where everyone's carrying a gun there everyone's carrying they're ready to throw down like hawaii is that way too oh yeah yeah, yeah. i love the hawaiian culture if you honk your horn at somebody in hawaii You're someone's gonna him. get out of their car and beat the fuck out of you and i'm like that's beautiful i love that it's, <laughs> it's respectful dude last time i was in hawaii i was uh i didn't go to the beach this day but uh a friend of mine so it's angie's brother mm-hmm. he was at the beach and he was surfing and he got on someone's wave like not understanding the local etiquette mm-hmm. and fucking just grabbed him and fucking clocked him no right, way. right in the fucking like the shallow water there on the beach <laughs> it's like he's fucking 45 years old trying to surf he's not trying to fight anyone yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know well guess what you're in hawaii and you took my wife so we're yeah, fighting <laughs> love it I, I love the fight culture it keeps it real dude i think one thing that's cool about hawaii is that if you're a jiu-jitsu guy you're in yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying, dude. Yeah. Like, just if you're good. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've always heard like it's hard for like outsiders to get in. Yes, you know. But I went to Ho- I've been to Hawaii like three or four times in the last couple of years, mm-hmm. and I'll pack a gi. Like I went to and trained at BJ Penn's school yes, one time. I've been there too. And yeah. I remember you told me you said there's a ni- another nice school up the street that kind of looks like an AOJ. Mm-hmm. And I went and looked at it. I didn't train there though. Do you, what was what's the name of that place? Do you I remember? Don't remember, it's been a minute. And uh, but then there's been other times that I haven't brought a gi and just randomly running into people yeah. and they see my ears. They're like, Hey man, let's train. Yeah. You want to train? And I was like, dude, I don't have my gi here. And this guy's like, I got extra gis, yes. man. Yeah. He's like, this is a dude I've never even said two words to. I'm sitting there with Jenny and he's like, Hey, you want to train? That's kind of cool. Right. It's the culture, dude. I love it. I Cause, love it. Cause it's a lot of people are afraid of the Hawaiian culture. You know, a lot of people are pussies <laughs> no, for real though. It's, it's not yeah, meant yeah. for them. You know no, Yeah, I mean? you're right, dude. And I, I, I love that thing of like, stop honking your horn. Like, I hate that, that noise pollution. It's so, <laughs> uh, it, to me, if you honk your horn at me, I should be able to punch you in your fucking face. Oh, dude, I could completely fucking agree. It's so unless, rude. unless I'm sitting at a green light, checking Instagram instead of hitting the gas pedal. Yeah. Hey, go. My and, like, and, you know and what I mean? Do it like beep. Yeah, like, hey, it's time to go. Oh, but yeah, the, yeah, my these bad. These cocksuckers. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, or, or, they're, or they're doing it like, uh, dude, if, if say, I'm in reversing into your car, yeah, fucking hit your horn. Like, let me know. But if you're not doing it to, like, let me know something, you're just doing it to say, fuck, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dude, and, the, the tone of the horn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What is the tone? <laughs> yes. If the tone is like, hey, bro, it's time to go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah my bad. No. Mm-hmm. Fuck you. you. <laughs> and, and, and like, oh, it's so obnoxious. <laughs> Dude, it's funny you say that because I'll honk at people exactly like you said, like if they're not going at a light, quick little beep, right? Yeah. And Siler, you know Siler, my mm-hmm. oldest, she's always like, Anytime anything happens, she'll be like, dad, why didn't you honk at that person? And that's exactly what I told her. I said, Siler, in my world, if I'm going to honk at someone, I have to be ready to fight that person. Yeah. 
That's literally like the threshold that I'm at. Correct. You know, and uh, she thinks I'm the crazy one. And I'm <laughs> like, no, you have to realize there are people that are going to interpret that as aggression. I, I don't even know where my horn is because there's been times <laughs> when I needed to hit the horn and I'm like, I, I don't know where it's at and I just fucking deal with the situation. Because, yeah. you know, I, I'm a big snowboarder too. Yeah. So I'll be like snowboarding and lose control on some fucking icy mountain road sliding sideways and I'm like trying to, I don't even know where the fuck it is. Like, <laughs> Man, COVID fucked up snowboarding last year, huh? Yeah, Dad, it could cut it short. I had a good season. You still had a good though. season. Yeah, so I just cut it short, and then pushed a lot of people. Oh, push a lot of people out to the backcountry, and just people were dying left and right. Oh, if, really? If you're not trained in backcountry, stay the fuck out. You don't belong out there. It's dangerous. Yeah, I guess I'll stay the fuck out then. <laughs> Dude, my trip to Alaska this year. Holy shit, it was so severe. So. We we went hella boarding in Alaska in Haines. So all the top snowboarders across the entire world come to Haines, Alaska for three weeks out of the entire year. It's like the perfect time. And I was there with some of the guys from the Red Bull film team. So like these guys are the shit. I was there with some Olympic skiers and they were all part of it. But we came up on I'm gonna make up a day here. I can't remember which one it was. So we came up on like a Monday, but on Sunday, the day before, there was another chopper out and uh the whole team was an Olympic uh, skier and a couple billionaires crashed and they all died. Oh shit! In the, heli, yeah. the day before I got there, so it was pretty solemn. I don't I don't remember what the, who the people's names were, but it was pretty solemn. It wasn't a great vibe. When yeah. I got there. Like then the next day, uh, it wasn't part of my group. It was part of another group. Uh, so when you go down, you kind of watch the guy in front of you because you don't want to go too close to him because you can trigger an avalanche on top of him. So the first guy goes down. It looks clear. So the second guy goes down. Well, when the first guy went down, he fell. And when he fell, he fell into a grizzly bear's den and woke up the grizzly bear. <laughs> it was, you fucking with me right so now? It was mama. He woke up mama. And he's in her fucking den. And now, <laughs> now, I don't know how familiar you are with sleeping bears. but they <laughs> Dude, I'm not familiar with sleeping bears at all. <laughs> You're from Washington. I figured you'd seen that shit. You on land? <laughs> no, dude. Never seen a sleeping bear. And they don't wake up like you would wake up. I mean, this motherfucker's been asleep for months. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? Like, they wake up groggy and fucked up. So it wakes up like. <laughs> so homeboy has enough time to escape the monster, and he goes and he runs the fuck out of the den. Second guy is coming down, snowboarder number two. He doesn't know that his homeboy fell in the den. So what from the words from his mouth that he said later is he was riding, following the trail from the guy in front of him, and then the tree reached out and grabbed him. Because you're moving fast on the snowboard, the last thing you're looking for is a brown fucking grizzly bear that looks like a fucking tree. And it grabbed him, and it, like, ripped off his arm, <laughs> fucking just, like, like, really tore him up, dude. Ripped off his ear. <laughs> Fucked him. I don't know. I don't know why I'm laughing, but it fucked it's like all every up. time I see you, you got some fucking crazy, crazy story shit, right? like this, dude. And then number three, guy, guys, this has to be a bad joke. No, <laughs> I'm waiting for a punchline or snowboarder something. Snowboarder number three comes down and he beats off. Maybe that's a bad term. He <laughs> fights off Mama Bear. <laughs> Luckily, Mama Bear, like, retires or re 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 retrieves what's the word retreats, retreats. Yeah, okay. Mama yeah, yeah. retreats from the fucking battle and homeboy takes his fallen brother snowboarder out of the fucking scene but he's like missing an arm missing an ear tore the fuck up and he survives but it fucked up forever you know god dude and then my guide who's also one of my great friends his name's doug stout he the ice man I, ice man you know doug yeah well i know him through instagram ice axe expeditions he was yeah. my guide and i've always been wanting to go out with doug because doug doug's not a guy he's like the guy like i hang out with him in squall and people are like oh my god is that Doug? like uh -huh. fam famous expeditionist so anyway I, I meet doug up in alaska and i come up and i give him a hug and he's kind of like standoffish he's not himself well, it turns out he had a fucking heart attack and didn't realize it was a heart attack. And this dude guided us for the next week under a heart attack the whole fucking time. He was like undergoing that. He goes back home. Like he, I could tell he was fucking off the whole time. He thought he was poisoned by some type of gas fumes in uh -huh. a guide meeting, but he had actually undergone a heart attack. The moment he landed in uh, 
back in, in Tahoe, because that's where he lives, he went and got an EKG, and they rushed him to heart surgery, and he had an uh, uh, open heart surgery right then and there. Yeah, I saw that picture of him on Instagram. I'm like, what yeah. the fuck, dude? And he was out there guiding us, dude, and guiding is so fucking hard. It's like you're you're going through snow that's up to your chest. <laughs> well, bro, remember when we were in Revelstoke? Oh, yeah. And we, w- w- there was a, we took the chairlift to the top, and there was like one little area that the chairlift didn't go to. And you're like, dude, let's hike up there. <laughs> so we'd take our boards off and we're hiking through like waist deep snow. Yep. And then like four minutes into it, we're both like. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> ready? Four <laughs> minutes and 10 feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, nowhere. And I remember you're like, dude. What are we fucking doing? <laughs> <laughs> Got to get that extra 10 foot of travel. Dude, that was a fun trip, man. Oh, it was incredible. I'm, I'm glad we went. Let's you do guys, more. What's that? Let's do more. Let's do more, man. Like, I bought all my shit last year. Remember that? Yep. yep. I was like, I, I, I snowboard once a year with Charles. Yep. But if I'm going to consistently do it once a year, I got to get all my own shit, dude. Let's let's do Jackson Hole this year. Let's do it, dude. I love Jackson. That's yeah. one of my favorites. Um. But yeah, we drove up from Seattle to Revelstoke. That drive was fun as fuck. Yep. And it was gnarly too. Remember like how like twisty and turny and the mm-hmm. fucking snowstorms and shit. And I was like logging trucks going by. I was like, yep. fuck, dude. This is I remember Jenny's like, Do you want me to drive for a little bit? I'm like, fuck. I feel I wouldn't feel comfortable with anybody driving. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like yeah. yourself or anybody else, it all sucks. You're just kind of like <laughs> yeah. i'd rather be in charge of this yeah no but that was fun man i remember like uh your chick would buy a box of donuts mm-hmm. and jenny and me still laugh about this she cut them all up into yeah. little like bite-sized things that's an asian thing right no just so everybody gets she's being nice no i so know but some. like that's like no americans would ever buy a box of donuts and then cut them all up that's not asian you racist fuck. <laughs> well How it, dare you? It's, it's something dude <laughs> no no she was being nice for you guys no but we all shared like that was kind of the theme of that trip maybe you don't know this because that's like that was your normal life with her but you guys share food like remember we went to what was it we were like that asian we got like fucking what are they called pot stickers and a bunch of yeah uh, yeah, yeah remember all of those different asian mm-hmm. things and then we all shared them mm-hmm. and i remember sue ann was telling us like what this is and what that is and yeah. I, don't, I don't know what any of this shit is yeah <laughs> but then it was well, that- vancouver is known for having some of the best chinese food yeah yeah and, but it was like the same vibe you yeah, guys the, share food the community like i'm the nice. opposite of that like I don't share, get the fuck away from my food. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it was actually cool because we bought a bunch of different donuts. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, Hey, you get a maple bar. It's like, no, you get a bite of a maple bar. Yeah. Then you get a bite of this. No, I I think it's something we do. Okay. Because they got the donuttery in Huntington beach and it's the best donuts I've ever had, Uh but I'll do the same thing. I cut them up so everybody can try a little bit of this and that. And dude, it's fucking rad. Yeah. Right. Do you still eat McDonald's? Yeah, occasion. Yeah. Yeah, it's always good. You know, I, I get a complaint, you know, so I'm sure McDonald's owners are going to hear this. And uh, McDonald's is probably one of the biggest fast food chains in the world, if not the biggest. Yeah. Get your shit together. Why, why? What's their issues? Well, they have lots of issues. Why does breakfast stop at 1030? <laughs> you tell me you can't make a fucking egg McMuffin at 11? Really? Bro, once it's 11, you have to eat a Big Mac. Like It's, it's nonsense. Everybody comes to mcdonald's for the breakfast that's what it's best at Uh uh-huh like let's keep it going keep it rolling (laughs) what the fuck i remember last time you were in town you're like hey can we swing by mcdonald's dude we don't eat mcdonald's (laughs) i haven't been to mcdonald's since i was a little kid right really and like me and jenny are like wait what charles wants to wants to go to mcdonald's for breakfast (laughs) and you're like fucking jacked you're in good ass shape you know it's like how the fuck's he McDonald's and look like that? <laughs> Jenny was offended. I, I do Jenny. Jenny can get in really good shape if she wants to. Yeah. But she has to eat like air and salads. Like she has to stay. Her body wants to like store weight. You mm-hmm. know, if she eats donuts and McDonald's, she blows up, dude. It is what it is. But, but from all my research, all my knowledge, it's about calories in calories out. Whether you ate a thousand calories in Skittles or you ate a thousand <laughs> calories in broccoli, yeah. the amount that it's going to stick to you is the same. I don't know, man. The, the, I think the I think the formula is more complex than that because I think it was Lee Priest mm-hmm. that said, "There's not a person out there that's gotten fat eating chicken and apples." 
Show me, show me the person that got fat eating chicken apples. I guarantee it. I guarantee you will. You if think you, there is? Yes. If you eat, because dude, what? if you, if it, okay, if you're Lee Priest, you're five foot two and you sit around. <laughs> Lee Priest did get fat, by the way. Yeah, yeah. He was always fucking fat when off season. But it probably wasn't chicken and apples. <laughs> it's probably fucking French toast and syrup and no, Pepsi. it's it's all, it, dude. It's simple science. Calories in, calories out. It doesn't matter what the fuck you eat. The only reason it matters what you eat is for the nutrient levels. Mm -hmm. Yes, but as far as gaining weight goes, it's all about calories in. Calories. I love that you said it doesn't fucking matter if it's broccoli or Skittles. It doesn't. Because dude, I don't even look at Skittles as food. <laughs> Neither do I. You know, like, but, when I see my kids eating that kind of stuff, I'm like, it's almost, it, I almost feel like they're eating like little pieces of plastic, like little toys or something. Because yeah. I'm like, dude, that's not food. What are you, what are you doing? That's not, quit putting that in your mouth. Then where, then where are they getting it from? Oh, bro, where do you think they're getting it from? Hey, can I have this? Can I have this? <laughs> from you. Yeah. You're, or, you're an enabler. You, bro, you want to know what's Financial the, enabler. What the worst is, is fucking the ice cream man. Oh. That fucking song starts playing in the mm -hmm. house. You hear it from a mile away. It, bro, it's like fucking Pavlov's dog. It's like you're they're right? ringing yeah. the bell, dude. Yeah, that's right? a good point. <laughs> and like... They become like animals, like oh, ice cream man. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, I don't want, I don't even know how my kids have money because they don't, they don't have allowances. They're stealing it from you. <laughs> Bro, they might be. I'm not kidding. Reagan, Reagan comes downstairs with like $65. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of money. <laughs> and they, they each come back. And I didn't know that she had that much money at the time. I like, she, oh, the ice cream man runs up to her piggy bank or whatever goes out and they buy like $30 worth of ice cream. Holy shit. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck are you guys doing? But whatever. I got to remember, like I, I didn't grow up on a strict diet. My parents, I got to eat fucking Reese's peanut butter cups and wash it down with Coca-Cola. Like, <laughs> yeah, disgusting. Right. I grew, I grew up eat, dr eating and drinking trash. <laughs> <laughs> and so I want to like, part of me is like, my kids can't eat this stuff. It's poison. But at the same time, it's their fucking life. And if they want to enjoy ice cream and candy sometimes, I feel like I, you got to balance it because that's part of being a kid, bro, right? Bro, honestly, and this, I, I mean this, I, people go against me on it. I don't think it makes a fucking difference. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm dead. If you're a bodybuilder, yeah. But if you're just a performance athlete, especially an endurance athlete, have you ever seen what endurance athletes eat? Garbage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Constantly. Well, no, that's because like... I mean, do you know who Dean Carnassus is? No. He's an ultra marathon runner. Okay. And his thing is to eat entire pizzas. Yeah. And it's, he said, I can't find food that's calorically dense enough outside of like processed junk food because mm -hmm. I need massive amounts of calories. And that's the thing. It's, it's, you just need the calories. And if you're overly over consuming, that's when the fat comes in. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it doesn't matter. Are you missing nutrients? Yes. So but you're going to get osteoporosis and shit, but maybe, maybe bro. I, as a kid, I don't think I ate anything but Burger King and I would eat it a couple times a week and I would eat some Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, were you I fucking grew, jacked your yeah, whole life? Yeah. And I grew up to become a fitness model, like, <laughs> but this is my main, my main reason behind that play, play girl, yeah, man of the year. Yeah, yeah. Like, and my main reason behind that was I've never really gave a fuck about food <laughs> i didn't like my mother would force me to sit down and eat as a child because i didn't want to eat i was missing out on doing something fun i was always hyperactive wanting to run around and play and do shit and jump i don't want to eat fucking food it's lame you know like, <laughs> like i was so hyperactive i couldn't sit at the table and eat i wanted to go out and have fun yeah and in I'm, today's world that's no longer being called a little boy. Oh, I that's know. That's being ADHD. Oh, yeah. And then they would have medicated me. Yeah. That's horrible. Fuck you know? yeah, it's horrible, dude. I'm just so glad they didn't put me in special ed classes because then I would have thought something was wrong with me <laughs> and I would have already stunted my own personal growth because I would have thought I was a mess. You know? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, fuck, dude. We're already an hour and 20 minutes into it. Holy shit. I want to get into the porn, though. I have so many people that when they find out, like, dude, you're friends with Charles Dara. I'm like, I'm not just friends with him. He's one of my favorite fucking people in the world. Fuck yeah. Thank you, my brother. It's the truth, man. And it's because like in the jujitsu community, you meet a lot of people. Yeah. But I remember I was training in the night class typically because I was working during the mornings and you hit a lot of morning classes. 
And then there's people like Sid and Miles and whoever that bounce back and forth, right? Yeah. And so they're always telling me, man, I can't wait till you meet Charles. I can't wait till you meet Charles. Yep, I see you the same thing. <laughs> and dude, when we finally met, I was like, I fucking love this dude. Right. Because you, like we've said before, you do your life on your terms. Just like you. Whatever the fuck you want. I feel like I'm arriving at that point now, but I had to play the government game for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been on your path. Since you walked out of the Marine Corps, 21 years old, said, fuck you. Yeah. I'm going to do whatever I want. But how did it, how did it morph from Chip and Dales to being the top browsers, male performer? <laughs> I, uh, I was working for a playgirl at the time because I was modeling still when I was a Chip and Dale. Uh -huh. And, uh, I, I, I shot for playgirl and I did my first nude fucking thing because, uh, I thought I could make a lot of money with it. My buddy had done it and he became man of the year and he sold a bunch of shit. And I was like, wow, I can make like, like 30 to hundred grand a year doing this. I'll, I'll add it to my salary. I'll do it. I couldn't wait again. I was thinking about money, not thinking about my passion. Yeah. And uh playgirl wasn't for me. It was, it's kind of like weird. Like, look at me. I'm not a look at me guy. I, I don't like that. Especially when it comes to sexually, I think it's odd. Um, and it, and it draws in a lot of the gay guys and, uh -huh. you know, nothing against gay guys. I'm just not gay. I don't like <laughs> men's sexual energy directed toward me. It makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> but the gay guys love you, dude. Well, gay guys love everything. <laughs> They're gay guys. I mean, I mean it, guys will fuck anything. Uh -huh. Now, if you're a gay guy and you're a good looking dude, of course they want to fuck you. Uh -huh. <laughs> I never liked that energy being directed to me because it's, it just made me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So I shot for Playgirl, and I didn't really enjoy it. I, I kind of regretted it. I was like, oh, what the fuck did I do, you know? And uh, But it, it worked out to my best interest. Like, again, the universe has in store for us where we're supposed to be. So they hired me to go to the AVN Award convention show, not the AVN Award, but the AVN convention show, and hand out flyers as man of the year. They were paying me to do the job and paying me well. So this was 2007 time frame. So I went there and I started passing out flyers. Or it was actually 2006, passing out the flyers. And uh, I met a bunch of super hot chicks, like porn chicks. I think Roxy Giselle was one. And uh, she's like, hey, do you want to go up to my room and fuck? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I went and I fucked her. And she's like, well, you're pretty good. Like, do you want a job doing this? And I go, well, I don't know. I don't know. And then she goes, well, I'll introduce you to my friend. His name's Tommy, Tommy Gunn. And so I met Tommy, and Tommy was from Philadelphia just as I was. We kind of hit it off, and he was a little bit older than me, and he was actually the performer of the year that year. So he was like a guy with stature who knew what the fuck he was talking about. And I asked him, I go, how much money do you make? Because, again, I was always so concerned with money. Yeah. How much money do you make? And he told me, and I was like, <gasps> I want to start right now. And they said, really? I go, yeah. So I called up one of my homies. He knew this guy named K Beach who owned a porn company called K Beach, Kevin Beach. And uh, I shot my first scene for Rick Davis. And uh, I did well on the scene. And I called up Chippendales after I shot my first scene. And I go, listen, I fucking quit. They're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I don't ever want to do this again. I quit. I'm, I'm becoming a porn star. They're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and this was 2007 at this time. And I just... Never looked back. I was so excited just to go. And finally, I love porn because it's all about the girl, not me. Yes. It's about me showing the girl off. And that's what I love. Like, it's my job to dominate the girl and make her look good. And then I show her off to the camera. That's my shit. So it's my artistic expression. So now I'm at a point in my life where I'm a producer, director, and performer. And uh -huh. I, I only like producing and directing for myself. I always like being the performer. I, I want to do it for the rest of my life. I love performing. That's that's my art. So you say you don't like being the producer or the director? I love being the oh, producer. Oh, you like that. But I love being the producer and director for myself. Okay. For my own shit. And how long did it take to like get to that point? Mm, for me, it took a long time just because I wasn't interested in it. I've always been so interested in just performing. Yeah. Uh, but now I, I still, I don't like to shoot other guys. I like to be the only one. I like it to be my show. I'm just, I love it, dude. I, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm the alpha male. I, you can't take that away from me. That's my, that's my spotlight. That's what I do. And I'm, I'm going to die on that fucking spotlight. I don't give a shit. You know? <laughs> dude, I love it, man. So, yeah, come check out toughlovex.com. That's my website where I created my alter ego, Carl, Carl Tough, Tough Love. Love. And it's all about Carl Tough Love's adventures. So I remember you were telling me, you're like, dude, people will book Charles Dara mm -hmm. or 
Carl Tough Love. Yeah. Because yeah. your alter ego has actually become like its own persona Correct. in the industry. Yeah. And and Carl's a lot more fun than uh-huh. Charles Dara. Because Charles Dara has to play the game. Charles Dara is a stepdad. Charles Dara is doing all that lame shit. I mean, <laughs> it's what people click on. People like the idea. I don't give you the idea in my work. I give you fucking Carl Tough Love. You know, he is the fucking main character. That's what I love. Dude, I don't know if you remember this, but you were at my house and we were up and it was late and you pulled your laptop out and we were in my kitchen. Okay. And you're like, bro, I got this idea. No way. Yeah. And you're like, the guy's going to have like his own van. (laughs) And you were like talking to me about Carl Tough Love it's in crazy, its, in right? its infancy. Yeah. And then you and then it became a real thing. Dude. And now it's like five years later and I'm still running it. It's insane. And now I have Carl Tough Love on my snowboard. Fuck yeah. Um but dude, what was that fucking what was that ride like? Like you Which st- ride? You started porn in 07. Correct. And February second, two uh, uh, 07. And it was just kind of like a one-off thing like oh i can make a bunch of money and then did you just hop in with both feet and you were doing it every fucking day and yes i hopped i dude i so february 2nd i shot my first scene and then i got uh i, I signed with la direct models that was my agency and they said at that time i had the fastest moving career they'd ever seen i would literally work 30 to 40 scenes a month every month every day i was fucking <laughs> working one to two scenes i i absolutely loved it, it it's Get to bang chicks. You can't beat that. Like, I found out. I was like, "Wait a minute." So, what does a guy get paid to get a blowjob? Just a blowjob, not a sex scene. And they were like, two hundred dollars for a blowjob scene." And I go, "How many of those can I shoot a day?" They go, we get like two or three. I go, "Wait, I can make like six hundred dollars a day getting my dick sucked right on my motorcycle around Southern California." Like, <laughs> sign me <laughs> up, like, <laughs> dude. And that's not even like that's out of the realm of reality for most people, right? You know, it's insane. I'm like, so hot chicks, you're going to pay me, pay me to have hot chicks suck my cock. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Cause remember I was always the guy that was into hookers to begin with. Like <laughs> dude, I'm the biggest man's man. I don't, I don't matter. Ladies man. I'll never say I am. That's why I didn't love Chippendales. Cause it's all about providing the woman's fantasy. Uh-huh. I don't want to provide the woman's fantasy. I just want to do me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to hang out the homies and be a man's man. You know? So like, when did it really blow up for you? So when I came back. So what I did was I did porn from 2007 to 11, 11, 11. That's the day that I got took, your purple belt, right? Yep. I got my purple belt and my father passed away right all in the same time. And that's when I decided to stop porn because porn, as I said, it paid the bills. I enjoyed it. It was fun. But my true passion still lied in later lied in fighting. And I wanted to accomplish all the things in life that I wanted to do with fighting before I was too old. Mm -hmm. So I said, halt everything. Uh, And I had a great girlfriend at the time who allowed me to live in her home rent free, which was the biggest thing to make it possible. So I could just go and train jujitsu all day long, MMA all day long. And work on focus on myself and my career as a fighter. And I did, mm. I got to live my jujitsu dreams. I competed in all the biggest tournaments and I won a bunch of medals. And, and then by 2016, I had trained so much that my body was really starting to break down at that point And I could barely train anymore. And then I was like, fuck, I need to do something. And that was, I mean, you got your black belt, what, 2015, 16. Oh, okay. So I was like, I need to do something now that, you know, I've accomplished all these goals. What's next? Because, you know, as as a guy is getting older in jujitsu and you got your accomplishments, like it's, there's really nothing to, am I going to keep competing in a master's tournament? Like, it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, how many I know times can you win the same fucking tournament? You know, it's just kind of like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I wanted to do something more. So I was like, I'm going to go back to porn. And I went back to porn with the work ethic and the mindset that I had learned through martial arts. And that's when my porn career really took off because I just had a better attitude about toward everything. You know, I, I understood uh, manifestation, the things you say, neuro-linguistic programming, the focusing on your mind. And there, there's a lot going on outside your physicality. It's more mental. Yeah. So you said it's 2016. You, you went all but all in with porn again yep right back and i did better than ever before at that point point. and then are you still doing like 
Are you, are you doing only your own shit now? Or are you still no. doing kind of whatever comes your way? Like different? Yeah, I still work for everybody and myself. I mean, why not? Uh, who the fuck wants a day off? Like, I hate days off. <laughs> yeah, especially when your job is banging hot chicks, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I would rather, I, I work every opportunity I get. And the only time I do take off is if I'm going on a snowboard trip. Yeah. Otherwise. So you know, like on an average month now, how many scenes do you shoot? I probably work 20 to 25 days a month. That's fucking nuts, dude. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. And I'm grateful and blessed for the work. I truly am. I mean, you're 40, you said you're 43, right? 42. 42? Yeah. Most 42 year olds aren't fucking 25 times a month. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's funny, though, because people think that, like, my off camera life is so crazy with sex. It's not at all. Like, I really only fuck on camera because it's, it's a performance to me. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not a normal dude. I mean, my entire life is spent performing for sex, not for like hanging out enjoyment of it, you know? So I'm a little off probably. Well, but what does that do for, cause you had like people that when I, when you come up in conversation, the one thing that everybody thinks is crazy is that you have like steady girlfriends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, I always have steady. I've always had a steady girl and, and then how, we broke how does up she, and now I have a new one. How does she do that? How does she do that? I said, she, she's doing her. Yeah. Everybody's worried about like, putting your emotions into it, mm -hmm. you know, but dude, Sue Ann, she was fucking rad, super rad. And, and that, and like there was, there was never like when we're all hanging out, like any weirdness, no. you know? And I remember even Jenny told me one day, she's like, I would love to just pick her brain on it, you know? Yeah. Cause like, I want to know, like, how can, how does she deal with that? She goes, but dude, they're doing them and they're, and it's awesome. I, you know, if you know me, which you do, you know, I'm not falling in love on set. I don't yeah. give a fuck. It, it, <laughs> yeah. Sex is like a handshake. You know what I mean? Like I come in and I, and I shake the chick's hand and we move on. And that's what I love. There's no, I don't, I, do I have a deep connection, intimate connection when I'm fucking the chick? Sure. That's what makes a good sex. That was which what makes a good scene. But I don't want anything after that moment. It's nice in that moment. It's beautiful. Yeah. In that moment, we're so connected because I don't know shit about her. Like, I never talked to the girls before seeing. That destroys it for oh, her really? and me. Because they could say one thing to piss me off or vice versa. You know, like, for instance, I'm, this is not what I am, but I'm like, hey, what's going on? How? Like, oh, I'll give you a real, a real example. I, I met a girl on set the other day. And uh, I go, hey, we're, we were working together in Vegas. And I go, hey, where are you from? She goes, I live in Huntington Beach. And I go, no way. That's so cool. So do I. She goes, yeah, but I don't like it. And I go, oh, how can you not like Huntington Beach? It's one of the top five happiest cities in the country, by the way. She goes, because everyone there is racist. Oh, God. And I was like, really? I go, I live there, and everybody seems pretty cool about everybody and everything. And she goes, I saw a bunch of people holding Trump's, Trump signs. There's so many Trump supporters. And I'm like, how is that racist? And then she goes, we shouldn't have this conversation. And I go, you're probably right. So then we went and fucked and had great sex. Uh -huh. And we both went our separate ways and had a great day. Any conversation could only bring it down. Keep yeah. the fantasy alive. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. she doesn't need to know what my feelings are. I don't need to know what her fucking feelings are. Let's just fuck and move on. That's uh -huh. the, the beauty of my job. There's no... But uh, other guys need it. Other guys need a connection. They want to come in and give the girl a hug. Like, I'm very different from everybody else. We all have our own little inner workings. Are you able to say, like, who you enjoy working with in the industry or anything like, like girls that? girls' names? Yeah, yeah. Or probably... No, no, yeah, sure I can. There's a lot of girls that I like working with. There uh, truly is. And there's a lot of girls I don't like working with. Uh -huh. And I'm at a point in my career where I pick and choose the girls who I do and do not work with. And I, I say no quite a bit because I don't want to put a bad scene out there. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of top-notch great girls that, you know, I, I, I really enjoy to work with and enjoy to be around. Uh-huh. Damn, that's interesting. Because there's like, obviously there's the stigma. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And everybody thinks like I'm the furthest thing from what people think a porn dude is. I, I truly am. You know, it's it doesn't define me. It's just a gig I do so I can have money to go ride my bike and snowboard <laughs> with the homies. That's it. It really is. Like, yeah. 
I don't even fuck off camera. I tell people that. And like they, I did my friend's podcast, this chick, uh, and, uh, you know, you know, Ash, uh, Ashley, uh, from, uh, UFC, she's a UFC fighter, Ashley Evan Smith. Um, okay. Yeah. I did, yeah. I did her podcast okay. and I think she expected me to be like this sexual fucking deviant and, I'm like, no, I'm just a mellow dude. Like, I just fuck because it pays the bills. <laughs> I like it. She's all let down. Like, oh, yeah, damn, dude. yeah. I don't have these. This dude's not as wild. <laughs> yeah, I don't have these crazy sexual stories. Like, and I clock out and I'm done, dude. Like, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, dude. I, I meet chicks and I'm like, I don't. I don't care about your fucking sexual fantasy. I'm not here to fulfill that for you. Like, what do you do that's cool? You ride bikes. You know. Do, what do you do? Like, do you? Do you have anything cool about you? And most of them know. Like, ladies, do more than suck dick. Like, it's simple. It's basic. It's easy. They all do it. Like, hell, guys suck dick. You know, like, <laughs> it's not that fucking hard. Like, so go go make your money and then go do something cool afterwards. Yeah, like, have a skill. Like, I'll, I'll put together the sheets for the girls. Like, sh- tell me what your special talents, what are your skills. I'm writing a scene about you. I want to write something cool. Like, Maybe we could go out and we could go do this thing. Like, can you roller skate? Maybe we'll do a roller skating scene. And most of the girls, no, I have no skills. I don't do this. I don't do that. I'm like, really? You, you don't do anything outside of sucking dick? Holy <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Dude, do you find like a lot of girls going to that industry are just fucking basket cases? I think a lot of people are just fucking basket cases, period. Yeah, you're right, huh? Inside that industry, outside of that industry, any industry. I think a lot of people are, and especially in today's time with the youth. I mean, you have to understand, I'm around 19 to 25-year-old girls all the fucking time. You know what I mean? 18 to 25-year-old girls. (laughs) Yeah, you're the old guy now. (laughs) Yeah, I've got nothing in common with these girls. You know, like, they grew up different than than I did. I I just... Yeah, bro, I, I, I mean, I... I joke about all the time. If I were to find myself single, mm-hmm. I don't think I would even consider going out with a girl that's younger than 30. Really? Because what are you going to fucking talk about? Well, well there's fun. There's fun. Let's say I'm dating. They, no, no, they could be I'm fun. Dating a I'm girl not now sick. that's 23. The girl I dated before that was 19, and the girl I dated before that was 22. And we have a lot of fun. Yeah. You know I mean? But do I we, don't know, man. No, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> Young yeah. girls are fun. But you just got to be careful because they're. I feel like a lot of them play the victim mentality, and that's dangerous. Yeah, so I, I don't like to date girls in my industry because you can get canceled quick. I say the wrong thing. You know, like for instance, like, like I'm going to say this, but that's not what I am. Like, say I was like, oh, I, I voted for Trump. That could get me canceled in my industry. Just that alone. I swear to God, and I've seen it happen. Like, ah, dude, if you don't have the public opinion of the industry, you they come after get, you. Huh? You can get yeah, you get canceled. It's like my friend, my uh, production manager. He's a comedian. And same thing there. Like, motherfuckers get canceled quick. You got to be careful what you say and do. If you're in a public eye, you know, Enter- being in entertainment these days is really rough. Yeah, dude. No, I remember you telling me stories about how, like, you got to be careful around certain people just because mm-hmm. you never know if they get to say, oh, he said this or he did yeah. that. And it's like, yeah. And they're sitting around waiting to make you fall. They get off on it. You know what I mean? Watching the failure of others. It's sad. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, the mic's starting to go out a little bit. It's going, it, why is it going out? Because you're, talk, you're talking to the top, the recording, oh, win, the recording window is the front window. There we go. There you go. Come on up here, baby. <laughs> Let it go. There we go. Well, fuck, man. We've been at it an hour and 40 minutes now. Let me whisper in your ear a little bit. Please do. <laughs> oh, uh, is there anything else you wanted to fucking talk about before we wrap this up and probably yeah. go out on the beach and hit the vape pen? Yeah, I dig young pussy, and I, I would, <laughs> give it give it a shot. Don't throw it away. Don't go with no y'all. Young girls are bad. It's not true. Young pussy is great. It still is. Trust me. Well, dude, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying like, I feel like you reach a point where you evolve, and you know what I think it is, dude. I think it's when you have your own kids mm-hmm. that changes how you look at girls. Dude, I completely understand. What you know you're what saying. I'm saying, dude. I like. Adva- girls that are advanced for their age though yeah you know what i mean like girls that are old souls shit like that. but i've always liked old souls even when i was younger because i'm not playing on the same card as most people anyway yeah like, like this girl i know her friend she's 30 years old she just was dating a 25 year old guy and they broke up and the reason being was this 25 year old guy said that she wasn't enough drama he wanted more drama in his life and i'm like 
He's a basic bitch. You're like, I'm going to show you the opposite of that. Yeah, I don't want drama. You know what I mean? Like, if you don't like butter on your popcorn, tell me, but don't throw it in my fucking face. That's <laughs> that's drama. Stand up for yourself, but don't be a lunatic. Or, or kombucha on your face. Yeah. 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 It's offensive. <laughs> Fuck, man. Well, cool, man. I appreciate you coming up and doing this. This is a my fun pleasure. show. And, uh, I think it's going to be interesting because obviously my following is a lot of like, it's more people that are of conservative nature, you know, mm -hmm. but bro, you should have fucking people in your life from all walks of life. I think it's a fucking, I think it's good. Well you know? rounded. Yeah, exactly, dude. And that's why I was like, I always find it funny when people think are like surprised that I'm homies with you. Really? You know, fuck them. Fuck them, dude. <laughs> no, fuck them is right, dude. I'm doing me, you're doing you, and it's fun, dude. Yeah. And I, I like having people around me and, and, and building friendships with people that are doing whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. You know? You can learn a lot from everybody. It's important, dude. I mean, that's why I want to buy a sailboat one day and just disappear. My buddy's doing that now. I should hook you up with him. What? He's already left? Yeah. He goes all the time. Bro, that I'm telling you, I think that's... And the, the cool thing about it is, like, I think that can be a goal for when I'm older. Because you could do that in your 60s. You know what I mean? I don't feel like there's a rush to do that, but I know I have to do it at some point. Cool. That's your calling. Go for it. Just fucking... Bro, think about that. There was people from the beginning of time that would just get in boats, like the Vikings mm -hmm. or fucking Christopher Columbus. They'd just get in a boat. And would go rape people. And we're just, <laughs> <laughs> bro, they're just going to go this direction until they find something. Yeah. And then go fucking do whatever they want. Dude. It's, it's rape and pillage. Yeah, bro. It's cool not knowing the destination. And I think that's a metaphor to life. Bro, 100%. Not just not knowing the destination, but the focus needs to be on the journey. Yeah. Not the destination. Mm -hmm. And like, at least for me, whenever I feel like I've arrived at a certain point, and it's funny we're talking about this. I was just talking about this on another podcast, but it's like, if you feel you've ever arrived, you're kind of full of shit. You know what I'm saying? Cause you never arrive at something. No, it, it's a continuous journey. And that's like, I mean, I learned that the most through jujitsu. I was about to say, yeah, that because I used to think like, man, I, I need to be able to beat this guy or I need to be good enough to do this or that. And now is like, as a black belt, I've been a black belt for fucking almost seven, God damn. Man, seven years already. Holy dude. shit. And, uh, I'm now, I'm comfortable just to just enjoy the journey, mm -hmm. you know? Because if you ever think like this is a benchmark I'm trying to make and then when I get there, I'm good, the needle's just going to move farther anyways. I've never believed in belts to begin with. I think it's all nonsense. Bro, I actually kind of like that you said that. I'm serious. Like, and that's why I still go by Joe Owls. We promote one time a year. Mm -hmm. And if you get your belt, cool. And if you don't, cool. And it's not like this big thing, you know? Mm. Like that event is a big thing. I shouldn't say it's not like that day we focus on belts and it's cool that day. Mm -hmm. And then you're the belt you are for the next two or three years, yeah. you know, instead of like every day, Hey, who might get promoted? Am I, am I getting ready? Do you, do you think I'm there yet? Cause I think if people are thinking about it like that, dude, their, their fucking head's not in the right space. So Joao gave me all my belts except my blue belt. I uh -huh. got my blue belt from John Lewis. And the way John did it, I thought was the best because instead of, you know, this is the day we do promotions. And if you show up and you're worthy of it, you get a belt. I was always like, eh, whatever. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, of course I'm probably going to get a belt. I come here and train every day. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm doing better of course, because I put my time in, but the way he did it was wouldn't say anything, never had a belt promotion. He would just suddenly come in one day and be like, here's a belt. And I remember I was a white belt and I went to grapplers quest and I fucking kicked ass. And then I came in the next day. I had no idea. And then he goes, Oh, belt ceremony. Here's Charles. He got his blue belt. And I thought that was fucking super dope because I earned that motherfucker. Not because it was the right time. Not like some military bullshit. Like how I became a corporal because this score equaled this. And here's your, yeah. your, your pros and cons, whatever the fuck it's called. I thought it was so much cooler that it was just like, Hey, you performed extremely well in this one event. Here you go. Yeah. That's dope. No, but that's also, I mean, I think it's, you just put the trust in whoever you decide to train, have train you. Mm -hmm. And then it comes when it comes, you but, know? But the belt doesn't matter is my point. No, it doesn't matter. That's not why I was there. I was never there to get a belt. I was there because I liked it. And bro, 
like the the more jujitsu evolves, I mean, the guys that are twenty two years old that are winning the world championships at blue belt. Mm-hmm. You know what motherfuckers they would be to roll with? Oh my god! You know what I'm saying, yeah. dude? And so, and I talk about this a lot, like belt colors in the like early 2000s. A brown belt's probably going to be the blue belt. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's kind of just how it was back now then. You don't know, bro. I got white belts that eat black belts up now. Yeah, you know what I mean? And it's yeah. it's fucking crazy. It doesn't seem like that should even be possible, but it is what it is. Well, it's just like college. Just because you have a college degree doesn't mean you're going to make fucking more money and you're going to be smarter. There's plenty of motherfuckers that have no degree and yeah, yeah. are on top of the fucking world. Yeah. So it's, Joe Rogan. <laughs> it's, on, you know? it's all on you. Yeah. Fuck, dude. All right. Well, you want to go out to the beach and, Let's do it. and hit the vape pen? Let's do it. All right, man. Let's do it. Hey.